Fantastic. Um, so uh, good arbitrary time of day, everybody who's uh, tuned in. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, Avni Wildani. I'm a professor of computer science at Emory University. I work in generally computer systems and neuroscience. And I'll be moderating this panel of brilliant people uh, talking about harassment within STEM. So this will give you an opportunity to ask scientists, including some you may recognize, to elaborate where they've experienced and addressed harassment. Um, and so if you've already screened their film, you can ask questions related to that or otherwise general questions are okay. There should be a Q&A that you can see where you can ask and upload each other's questions. Um, so the best, I'm not the panelists. And then without further ado, our esteemed panelists today are Professor Sarah Kim, Professor Jane Willenberg, and uh, Mr. Billy Williams. And I'll get out of the way and let them introduce themselves in that order. So uh, Professor Kim, if you can go first. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Sora Kim, and I am an assistant professor at UC Merced in the Life and Environmental Sciences Department. Uh, my work is at the sort of intersection of paleoecology, uh, modern ecology, and physiology, as well as using uh, the tools stable isotope analysis, so oftentimes in a geological context. Fantastic. Um, Professor Willenberg? Oh, hi. Hi, so I'm Jane Willenberg. I'm an associate professor in the Geological Sciences Department at Stanford University. And uh, I lead a research group. Uh, we do research in the area of geomorphology, or as I like to call it, the science of scenery, which is how the Earth's surface changes dynamically over time. And um, my research group's sort of uh, ways that we go about answering those questions are pretty wide ranging um, and the applications are also right, wide ranging but some of the um, things that we work on are adaptations to make as a result of climate change now and in the future and uh, we also try to understand soil sustainability from a resource and recently a justice perspective and i'm interested in improving academic culture for the better and um, I'm in the film that you may have seen. Brilliant. Um, yeah. And for those of you who haven't seen, I have already seen it. So please, Billy, go ahead. Please. All right. My name is Billy Williams. I serve as Senior Vice President for Ethics, Diversity, and Inclusion at the American Geophysical Union. For those of you who don't know AGU, then we are a global scientific society of about 60,000 members uh, working on all aspects of. Uh, of earth science uh, systems. Uh, in my role at AGU, I, uh, as, as a Vice President for Ethics, Diversity, and Inclusion, I do a lot of work in supporting our members, educating on issues around uh, uh, ethics, around uh, diversity, around inclusion, but we've also been very active in promoting anti-harassment practices. So I come at this not so much from an academic uh, faculty standpoint, but more from a scientific society standpoint and how we help change the culture and, and support uh, women scientists. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, so uh, as you said, like I said, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. In the meantime, the first question I have for the panelists is there are a lot of younger scholars out there in the audience and what can young scholars, so graduate students, postdocs, even assistant professors um, before tenure do if they're facing harassment and they feel a power imbalance? So I'm gonna ask that question to all of you, I think in the same order. So if you could go first, Sarah. Um, my solution was to leave my job. Um, I don't know that that's the best solution or an available solution to everyone. Um, yeah, but I, I think that the answer is actually different for everyone. You know, like there are people who do not necessarily, um, that aren't in the position of power and it's just not part of like their personality or their characteristics to like necessarily stand up and you know like fight and and do all that and that's okay and I think that um survival is like key a lot of times uh, for getting through these situations um 
for me personally, I, I think that it like really solidified um, that I'm okay with confrontation and, and being a fighter and, and taking a stand. And so, you know, that, that looks different. And, um, but I think that in the past, what people have been told is to just keep your head down and not make waves and that to wait until you get tenure to, to do that. And I'm hoping that that tide is changing and that the, the larger awareness and dynamic is, is, is there now. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with, with a lot of what Sora said. Um, you know, as you probably saw in the film or, or will see in the film later if you haven't, um, I, I waited until tenure to say something. And so I take kind of a pragmatic approach to when people ask me what the what they should do and I agree that it's very um, situation and person specific. I think that um, sometimes it is good to wait until you have tenure and I will say that it, one of the, the joys of getting tenure and becoming you know sort of more mid-career has been that I am able to now do a lot of the things that I put on my to-do list so that I, I sort of focused a little bit more on science. I mean, I always did some work community building and things like that. And I don't know if, if uh, you know, one of my worries is that I'm not really sure that um, the, the tide has changed enough so that people won't be penalized. And so that's why I, I hesitate to say like, oh yeah, go report. It's, you know, everything is fine now. It's definitely not fine now. And, you know, I think my case, which was resolved very recently, shows how incredibly difficult it is. Even if you have people writing that were witnesses down what happened and you have multiple women who all say the same thing, so we're definitely not in a place yet. And I think that one of the things that we can, we can do as a community is that we can, you know, one of the reasons that, that junior scientists feel like they need to speak up and say things is because the senior people are not doing it. So if we take the, the pressure and the load off of them to do a lot of this diversity and inclusion and equity work, then they can actually concentrate on the things that they need to concentrate on right now. And so if there are, you know, mid-career and <laughs> senior faculty out there <laughs> and administrators, um, let's do the work for junior people so that they can concentrate on things that will get them a job so that they can then, you know, become a person who can look back and help out people who are just coming up the ladder. Yeah, and I will say that like, me speaking up like that resulted in a situation where I like had to leave so like it's not necessarily that the tide has changed like I am in a place where I am supported and I feel protected in my current department and situation why I can even be on this panel and talk about these things but yeah I think that a lot of places you're right Jane are not there um so it it comes at a cost yeah um I come at this from a different perspective. I come at it from the perspective of, of someone who has to investigate complaints when they do come forward. I'm not one to suggest anyone what they should or would have to do. Uh, but I will say this, if you're dealing with uh, these issues, I would encourage you to at least document them to yourself and, uh, and put them in writing and in an email to yourself or to someone else now. Because even if it's 10 years from now, you decide, I'm ready now to go forward. Or you know someone else who's dealing with maybe the same uh, culprit and you want to support them. Having some evidence, some physical evidence that that did occur time stamped uh, is very, very helpful. Uh, within AGU, we were able to go back on a case for something that happened 20 years ago because a person had kept uh, email records. And that was what turned the tide. We have a policy here where there's no statute of limitation on any complaints being filed, and that's a very important. But even with that in place, it's, if you go back beyond uh, one year, it's tough, but you have to have some 
credible documentation or witnesses or whatever uh, going forward. So, so my advice for anyone who's dealing with these issues now is to share that information with someone, put it in writing, put it in an email, put it somewhere that is, that's clearly timestamped. The other thing I will say is that, um, and unfortunately I, I see a lot of this stuff uh, because people come to uh, me or to our ethics office in AGU because they're looking for support. And in most cases, people don't know where to turn. They don't know what to do. They feel that they're alone in this struggle and this power imbalance that you talked about. And we do have uh, some resources that are, are available to student and early career members, if you're a member of AGU, where we can provide, connect you to an attorney for problem solving consultation. This is not to say, let's go file a suit, but can give you some advice on your options of what you can do, what you, what you can consider. But more, than, more importantly than anything else, to let you know that you're not alone. And once that connection is made, we're out of the picture. We need you out of the picture. We don't know that discussion. We don't know where it's taken. Um, but we, we, we have reports back that that, is, that has been a helpful resource to some. Uh, so uh, that's it from a, from a uh, scientific society standpoint, from an AGU standpoint. But I would encourage anyone also to look within their own scientific society and to see if there's any support there if you're dealing with these issues. Thanks. I think that's really, really great advice. Um, so you think that, you know, especially young career faculty and graduate students just try to do everything in a documentable form, whether like it's a recorded call or an email instead of just having these kind of one-off conversations. And it's really good. Absolutely. Question. Absolutely, yes. Okay, um, there are a lot of good questions coming in, but before we jump ahead, I want to go back and ask Jane a small follow-up. Um, so you mentioned that there isn't really a lot of support from post-tenure faculty. Um, what is something concrete that you would recommend the post-tenure faculty in the audience do, you know, today? that to start going on the path of supporting uh, younger faculty and graduate students? Oh, that's a good question. Um, what can I do? Well, I mean, there, there are small things. I think that one way that you can, you can just be supportive of people. So um, one thing that I think is, is good is to build a sense of community. So any opportunity to reach out to new people, reach out to entire groups of students, like if you have a women and minorities uh, group at your university, to reach out and you know invite people over for, um, you know, if they're gonna be alone over the holidays or something like that, just to reach out and see if, if people are taken care of and and uh, feel like they're an important part of the community. So small, like, you know, micro actions like that. And then I think that there's a lot of great programs out there that um, can be quite helpful. For example, Advanced uh, Geo, um, an NSF funded project um, can uh, facilitate workshops to improve department climate. So that's a really helpful thing that you can do is request one of their workshops and then, you know, really encourage people to go. And then another thing is that, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of sort of when I hear something, I personally would like to be able to pick my battles. And so if there are a bunch of people who can get together so that it's not the same faculty member every single time mentioning when something problematic happens, I think that that is really helpful too. So that, you know, it's not the, the same person mentioning like that was a really problematic statement again, you know, <laughs> because I feel like people really um, start to tune those people out. So mm -hmm. I personally try to just like, you know, focus on the egregious ones, but I, you know, I've been in situations where I wish someone else would have been there to say, you know, that was also, like, am I gonna speak up twice in a faculty meeting? No, probably not, but I wish that I had a buddy to also speak up in a faculty meeting. Um, so those are, those are a few things. I'll keep thinking about it. <laughs> um, that actually leads nicely into one of the audience questions. 
Um, so somebody says that they're having a screening at the university and almost all the people who've RSVP'd so far are women. And this is to all the panel panelists, how you experience this and then how do you get more people to watch and engage both with the film and I would take this question a step further and say with um, anti-harassment efforts in general, right? Like I said, it's always seems like the same few people are coming up and those are generally the people who are under harassment to start with. So it's just another extra burden. Whereas people who have a little bit less on their plate tend to tune it out. So um, I'm just going to just go ahead and start with that, Jane, and then we'll loop back around. Me I don't have a... Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. Either way. Sarah, do you want to start? Um, I was going to say, I don't have a great response for that. I think that, you know, this is just like doing work related to um, diversity in terms of uh, race and doing anti-racism work as well that oftentimes that audience is dominated by minorities and and like while there is you know um uh discrimination even within uh ethnic minorities um and races like that's that's not actually who we're trying to target and so i mean i oftentimes i actually talk about this stuff in class um both like in terms of gender and race uh and i teach like straight up science classes but it's like this is actually part of science too so we're going to talk about it now um but uh and i tell them because like you know sometimes there's there's white men in the class and they might think like well this doesn't apply to me and i make it really clear to them and within my research group that i think that it is actually the most important to get white men on board and to be the activists and to understand what the issues are because they in reality are the ones that have the power to change the system um that i no matter what table essentially that we're sitting at like me as a non-white woman my voice is usually not heard necessarily as effectively as any white man and it's only when a white man or the white men start to like internalize and recognize and realize and preempt these issues that we're actually going to know that we've made a difference. Absolutely. Um, Jane, you going to say more to, I guess. Yeah, I, so I think that this film, you know, I think it's hit home for a lot of people. I've gotten a lot of LinkedIn messages <laughs> from, from men um, who who pr appear to be white, who, you know, it seems like they've really taken some of the messages to heart. And so I'm really, I'm really hopeful about that. I, I think one strategy that people can use that I've had some success with is specifically asking one man and like, you know, make it a, a specific conversation where you talk about how you would like them to watch this or, you know, something like that. And then, and then once they have seen it, you know, if it's, if it's sufficiently, you know, a, a good um, motivating activity, then make sure that like you could have them then go to their friends and say, you know, this was a really powerful film. You should watch this. And I feel like the messenger for some of these messages is really important. And hopefully that starts to happen. I think it's starting to happen with this film just from hearing little stories about it. I guess the next step um, is, you know, it's, I feel like it's a little bit easy in this film to uh, take, take sides like on my side, I feel like people are on my side after watching it. But then when it's your own colleague, I think it gets very hard for people to recognize that this guy uh, was someone's colleague. He, he was in a department and a lot of people in that department probably had no idea that such a thing was going on. And so you can imagine that that is happening currently all over the United States, right? and the world really like that people don't treat everybody with the same respect that they might be giving you and um so hopefully that step is a step that people make i'm hopeful about that but i'm not sure it'll happen because it's so hard uh, yeah so i watched the film today 
I had seen trailers before and uh, Dr. Willenbring, I just commend your bravery and, and what you did and stepping forward you and you continue to speak out. But like you, when you think about finding allies and, and men who can help support this effort, uh, I agree. I think finding one or two within your sphere of influence that you can say, watch this film or take it to your classroom setting and say, we're going to have a discussion about this next week in class. Everybody should watch it or whatever. If it's available that way, then I think that can help uh, send the tide and, and help some who might not otherwise view the film to view it. We do know from experience, and this was documented in the NASEN report, 2018 NASEN report, that forced training, especially in DNI related areas, are, are not, it's not effective. In fact, it can have the opposite effect. So you don't want to force someone into a situation where they are forced into a discussion that they are not comfortable having. But I think if you can find the right allies to help bridge that gap, and someone else can, can recommend it or put them in a situation where they can feel comfortable or more comfortable, then I think uh, the tide will, will turn. But in terms of what some of the, the more established members of the community can do, I, I would say have these discussions. Go into these uncomfortable conversations, whether it's on race or, or harassment, whatever. Have those discussions within your class, within your setting, within your group, and if you're uncomfortable doing that yourself, as, as was mentioned earlier, there are outside experts you can bring in, like the Advanced Geo Group. So there are people you can invite into your department to have those discussions and lead and facilitate those discussions uh, within your area. Thanks. I should like to ask you a quick follow-up to that. So you made a really good point that forced diversity training may have a counter effect. And you kind of see the sort of, you know, I would say, quote, forced, you know, you had diversity statements, you had to have broad participation within all of your grants, right? There's a lot of sort of diversity, you know, with, with all the best intentions, but often, right, it gets thought of as this extra bit of work to do and resentment may build up among people who've never really had to think about it before. So how would, I'm gonna start with you and then ask Sora and Jane also, how do you think that universities should kind of combat that and what can they do instead to help support people? Yeah, so uh, most universities have, will have com some type of compliance training for what's EO purposes or whatever. Uh, but I do think universities and department heads and deans and provosts, I think it has to start there and establishing what they expect uh, for their culture, for their environment, for their climate. And uh, to also, I would strongly recommend any department or any university, I mean, not, not necessarily for a full university, but to conduct some type of uh, climate assessment where you can probe at these issues so you can understand what the issues are within, you, within your department. So you can hear from the, 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 the female students or, or, or postdocs uh, so that you are more aware of what people are experiencing rather than thinking blindly that, oh, everything is okay here. Um, so I, I, would, I would just say having some expectation within a department that we're going to do this, that this other type behavior is not acceptable. We're going to test our climate as well and have some hard data around. Awesome. Um, Sora, same question. Um, I think that it is culture um, and that it's not enough to have it like come from the bottom up because clearly that has not happened. <laughs> um, uh, and that there has to be some, you know, top down. I absolutely like, um, at my previous institution, they uh, imposed this implicit bias training. And um, I was actually explicitly told not to go because it would like make my head explode at like the <laughs> off color and offhand jokes that the, like, that the facilitators who were like, senior faculty at, at the university um were saying and you know the small talk and so like my situation was unfolding and they're like oh yeah like you it's mandatory for everybody except you <laughs> and it turned out that um that like most um 
faculty of color did not appreciate the implicit bias training because of the the chatter that happened as part of the training. And so, um, so I think that, you know, the, even in bringing in outside resources and trying to implement that cultural shift is hard. And, um, and I think that every department, every college, every institution is in a different place and like pathway to make that happen. And you have to have support of the upper administration and someone in a position of power who's also willing to, you know, say that like, no, you're not doing this how it was intended. Like, this is wrong, you know, and not just roll out the trainings or roll out like the diversity talk, like actually walk the walk. And, um, and I think that that is part of the change that has to happen. Completely agree. It's, it's terrible when your implicit bias training is full of explicit bias. It's not like you can pick one or the other. Um, yeah. Jane? Uh, can, is, I hope that noise in the background, my dishwasher is running. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so it's, it is so weird how culture is, right? Like, you always think that it's, I feel like there's some, you know, kind of like, um, person chasing, you know, like a mirage in the distance almost, like this idea that if only the, the cohort that's coming up right now will become mid-career, then everything will change, right? But then they grow up in the same culture and the same things happen again and again and again. And I've seen this, you know, I get to go to lots of different universities giving seminars and things like that, fortunately. I and I love seeing different departments and how people are different and the culture of the department is different. And you can tell that like departments that have an awesome culture, they have cultures that are the same over generations of scientists that have come and gone. And so it's not about like getting, you know, more, you know, women or, you know, oh, if only we had two, minoritized scientists to come in, they'll fix everything, <laughs> right? And so it, it reminds me a little bit like of, um, you know, just like expecting too much, right? As people are trying to get their career going, they're supposed to be on this boat that's going, you know, downstream with the current culture and they're supposed to turn this huge barge around, that's just not going to happen. And so it really takes like people from all directions to change a bad culture. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, maybe it's something to think about too, you know, when you're deciding what kind of place you want to be, you know, pay a lot of attention to the culture of the department. Is this something that you want to take on as a big project when you're going somewhere as a graduate student, as a postdoc? Or do you want to go somewhere that already has a great culture and go somewhere that already values that? I think that's an important decision to make. And it's, it's a good thing, too, to try to work on culture if you find that you do have a, a department that has a bad one. But um, if you are at all able to, you know, make a decision, go with the place that values, you know, um, community and fairness and justice, right? Yeah, that's a really good observation that culture is a property of the department more than the individuals in many cases. Um, one of the people in the Q&A asked, uh, why do you think progress has been so slow for decades? And like, is there a radical change that can fix that? I think that you kind of started touching on that um, with saying that, you know, you had these entrenched cultures that were slow. And do you think that's why some of the progress has been slow? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I also hear a lot of, you know, like disclosures from people, especially after this, the science article came out, like I was hearing a lot of stories, as I'm sure the rest the other people on the panel have heard lots of stories. And like, sometimes I'll say, you know, is there a point at which you would feel comfortable reporting what happened? And, you know, a lot of times people will say like 20 years, like you, mm -hmm. like, it, it might not come around for 20 years. And so if you have this, like, it's almost like a, a smoothing function, right? That anything that you do 
or anyone who might report will only do so in 20 years. That's a long time to wait. Very much. Um, Could I just uh, add okay. in there? Uh, I, I agree. It's, it's a long battle, long struggle. A lot of it has to do with, with power. and um, But I would encourage any of you through your own professional society to pursue this as well as within your academic institution. Because in our experience, the professional societies have, uh, we can, we have the power to do things and we can move more quickly than some things might happen on campus just by, because we don't have to deal with tenure, all that stuff in terms of, of uh, what the cultural norms and expectations are. So for anyone who's listening in, I would suggest that you uh, stay tuned to and encourage things to happen through your professional society. And just a quick story. I was in a room that was five years ago and a female graduate student, it was a meeting at AGI, which is a member society, raised her hand and said, what are we gonna do about all this stuff that goes on in field work in the geosciences? And in that room, there were 75 people, probably 60 of those were men. I was one of the men in the room. And at that time, we all just looked down, we looked away. We didn't have an answer. We weren't prepared to talk about or address harassment at that time. This was September or October of 2015. This was a month or so before the Berkeley case made public and we started to get ourselves into action. Uh, but I would say speaking up and looking at the things that have happened since then, I think the, the shift has been uh, very meaningful and palpable, uh, a lot having to do with some societies and, and some institutions and national academies report, of course, uh, giving evidence and giving people things they can act on. So I, was, I sure hope it's not another 20 years on this. And, uh, Plus all other stuff we're dealing with at the same time. But we're dealing with a lot of stuff that's just baked into the systems. So I kind of want to do a quick follow-up on that. And sorry, Sarah, do you have anything that you want to go for? Um, so I think that I hadn't really thought about, you know, the um, it, you know, not agency, the organization, the personal organization being a good place for radical change. But I think that's a very, very good point, right? That universities are by nature and sometimes, you know, usefully lumbering, right? They're, they're large, they're slow, and they're set, set in their ways. Um, what flexibility do you think that um, organizations have universities don't? Um, and like, do you think that that is the place for radical change? And if so, you know, what do you think? Yeah, yeah so there's, there's no magic bullet here, and not all societies and organizations are ready to move forward. And even when we move forward, there's limits on what, can, on what or, uh, professional societies can do. In terms of what's one radical thing that can happen, I don't know. You might have to blow it all up. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't know the answer to that one. I, but but it's, as James said, it's complex, and it's going to take all of us together doing our part on moving on moving the, the the needle more aggressively than we have in the past. Not only on this issue. Uh, but all the intersectional issues on dealing with race and racism, on all the issues uh, associated with LGBTQ population, these things are all intertwined because usually somebody who's bad on one ism is bad on another ism as well. And we have to root those people out and can't just wait for them to die out. <laughs> and I guess in terms of like radical change, I mean, I think that the radical change does because the systems, like, yeah, you do have to, like, basically blow them up and start over, and that's not happening. So I think that the radical change has to be on an individual level. And so, um, like, when people hear about, like, the extent that I talk about, like, race and gender issues, I mean, I talk about in lab group meeting and am very explicit about things. Um, and, like, I think that, you know, this harassment, not even in – necessarily a sexual nature but just in a power dynamic um, and sort of a bullying manner that can happen at the lab bench like the late hours at the mass spec it can happen um, and 
happen in the classroom. Uh, and so, you know, I talk about it very much so in my research group, but then I also talk about it, like I said, in my classes, um, both at the undergrad and graduate level. And so um, I think that that is like my take on like radical change is that I think so much of the time I hear like, well, you know, like this type of conversation doesn't belong in science or that it's not part of how we do science. It's like, no, it is part of how we do science actually. Like that's what is being shown is that like science is done by people. Mm -hmm. And when you limit the people that get access to be able to do science, then yeah, it is actually affecting the science. And so I think that um, in terms of like, radical change in like a small step it's like people who um i mean i think that mostly stays probably with uh pis of labs but even like grad students and postdocs can bring up like hey let's read this paper and discuss it for lab group meeting like we don't always have to just dis i mean i was gonna say we don't always have to discuss data but there are plenty of papers out there now that have lots of data <laughs> <laughs> on this topic too and is done in like a scientifically rigorous way with evidence and yeah yeah i think it's a really good point i think a lot of people at least you know in my lab they're out of their comfort zones right they're used to dealing with data they know how to you know architect the system and build a model but once it starts you know getting to topics where there's no clear right answer and they feel like they know nothing about it they're scared. So, but how is that that different from some scientific topics, right? Like well, that's the whole point too. of science is that we're like pushing that boundary, and so, right, like, it's just like you know, um, yeah. I think that that's how we approach a lot of our like, yeah, the scientific fields that we were trained in. But mm -hmm. I don't think that we have to discount that approach. To oh yeah, no. with um, diversity and gender. Absolutely, I, I agree. I'm agreeing with you um, because. Right, like they, they don't have the tools. And so without something like those papers you bring up that actually have numbers, I think it's a little hard for them to sink their teeth into it. Once they have that, that might be a great way to jumpstart these conversations. Um, so I'm gonna go back can to the chain. Yeah, can I add to the radical change? So I'd really love to see three things happen, not just one. <laughs> so so uh, one of them is in terms of tenure. We don't do enough before granting people tenure to do like 360 reviews. That needs to happen. And we also need to do a couple of universities in the UC system and probably other universities have done, started doing background checks for mm -hmm. people from away before they come to a new university with tenure. That's awesome. Funding. So the NSF made huge strides in making it so that people can't like really bring new grants, but they need to start being making it so that people can be able to tell them about the sexual harassment and they need to investigate that, including places like the Smithsonian that are not like actual educational institutions, but have students working there. And then um, three lawmakers need to do Title IX-2, I realize that's a stupid thing to say, but <laughs> Title IX-2 that removes the whole protected class aspect and that, that just harassment in general needs to be banned because it's so hard to prove that it was because you're a woman or because you're a minority or whatever. That's not okay. And they should put in that law that there needs to be a list publicized so that no one else will hire them. That seems like more than three, but in my mind, it's three. <laughs> no, I completely agree. And I want to kind of jump off that a little bit and ask all of you. Um, so what part do you think funding agencies should really play in this, in terms of identifying harassers, in terms of maybe building and consulting the list to make sure that there are real repercussions for harassment outside of, you know, circles of people that they feel like they don't need to care about? Yeah. Uh, Jane, do you want to start with that and then I'll ask uh, since you were already kind of on that? I, I, was, I was so distracted by, I'm sorry, I have a hard time. 
focusing. I was so distracted by that. We need to eliminate tenure chat comments. <laughs> so I started thinking about that and then I was like, oh, that's, that's a different topic. Uh, if, you, if you'd like to talk to that, otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Like a person sees squirrels out their window. I'm like, yeah, so I, no, I don't, I don't think that eliminating tenure will help or work. I think maybe like a system like in Canada where you get three strikes or whatever and then you're out would be helpful. But um, like how many people have seen staff speak up about problematic people in the department? Like very few times and it's because they can just be fired, right? So we don't, I don't think we want that. And there are good reasons in terms of like political engagement that we decided tenure was a good idea, and I think those those still stand. Um, I added in even on the scientific side, right? You know, ten, tenure is good on several different axes, both for engagement and for building long research projects where you don't necessarily expect an outcome in you know five or ten years. Yeah. So there's 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 yeah, a lot of a lot of good reasons. Sorry. I'm uh, sorry. I <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe you could start back to the funding agencies, though, because I think somebody's asked this twice now. Um, in terms of the funding agencies, what do you what do you think that they should do to build real consequences? Me? Uh, sure. Are and then I'll go back to Sora and Billy. Yeah. So, um, I I think that they made a huge step recently, and so I give them credit for that. I do think that they are not, uh, they're losing opportunities, let's put it that way, by not investigating themselves. Um, the Title IX process in universities is like inherently flawed because it's a conflict of interest that you would hire someone who could be fired at any moment to decide if someone should leave or stay and if they're bringing vast amounts of money then it's even more so so um they should recognize that and at least allow people like to send them the title IX complaints um that have already been you know prepared by universities like right now they're not even they're not even doing that they're relying on universities to self-submit. I mean, that's just another, like, I, I give them credit for giving universities so much, <laughs> so much, having so much faith in these universities, but it's just not realistic that they would act in their own disinterest to, like, say, oh, no, we're, we don't need those, that million dollar grant. Or, or we person. don't need that overhead. We don't need that. that. Yeah, exactly. The university are going to do that ever. Yeah, so that seems a little unrealistic to me. So they definitely need to. I mean, like if you submit something that has been plagiarized, they'll like just pick it up in a second and investigate it. So I don't understand why they think that this scientific misconduct is different from plagiarism or data, you know, fabrication. What, what is the difference to me? I, I really don't understand why there would be a difference in their mind. I personally think that it comes from a value of like, of women and minorities in the system. Um, that that's like, you know, the, the difference of, of, you know, um, what, what's at stake. Um, and that's, part of the like historical nature of, of the system and who has power. Yeah, and, and just building on that from, from Soar and also from Jane, um, because uh, they do not define uh, harassment as scientific misconduct, and only falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism are defined as scientific misconduct. And that's not for NSF to decide. Let me just be very clear. They're constrained by what some other government agency, a GEO, or someone 
puts it in the definition. NSF wants to do more, and they have come a long ways over the past three years that I've been observing them. But this whole concept of how you address harassment and what is your response to that, and, uh, and it was correct in pointing out that sometimes, I mean, in most cases, something concerning fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism gets more penalty and more res- more impact against the offending party than somebody who's found as a harasser. It's just ridiculous. So I know at AGU we have, we do define within our own policies, harassment, bullying, and discrimination as scientific misconduct because of the impact that it has in our field. Uh, but again, our, our, our scope and range and impact is limited to those who are our members or, or what might happen uh, concerning our members. Uh, but I think if we could continue to push for this to be defined as scientific misconduct, it would get a heck of a lot more attention and would have a heck of a lot more impact when, when someone is found guilty of, of harassment. That sounds like a really nice takeaway from this panel is trying to push towards getting harassment to be counted as scientific misconduct, not just misconduct, misconduct. Okay, so under the line. Um, so going back to the Q&A, um, so this kind of ties into what you were saying. So I'll start with you, Billy, and then kind of go around. Um, how do you deal with the harassers that are already there and how vital they are to people's careers in terms of recommendation letters? Right, so science is a house of cards called recommendations. And a lot of this is essentially shadowy back room saying, yeah, your student can work with me, my student can work with you. Right, so how, how do we kind of get past that? So I'm not sure I understood the, uh, the so question. The, I guess the question uh, is, given how powerful recommendation letters oh, yeah. and networking are within the sciences, right? And how kind of little oversight there is over that portion of the of the field, what do you think we can do to help combat the oversized role harassers have? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Um, and because these networks are powerful, I think we have to, women scientists especially, or um, we have to form coalitions where we can support each other and those powerful women scientists can also write support letters for those who they are aware of. I know there are some institutions that have, I mean, they spin up, one of their goals is to make sure this person in their department is nominated for a certain award uh, in a certain period. And that's not usually a women's, a woman scientist. Uh, so I think when we are aware of those situations, then um, uh, I, I don't know how to crack that system. Again, I'm not in academia. I don't know how to crack that system. But I think awareness of those systems and that pro- those processes that are in place can allow you to challenge those. And I don't know what, a, what it takes to spin up something that's equally powerful, uh, but I think, I think it allows you to at least be aware, be aware of the forces at work that are working against you. Well said. Uh, Sora, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I, I put a lot of value in recommendation letters. Um, I like when I'm bringing in students and then also when I've been on, um, faculty hiring mm-hmm. committees. Um, and I mean, I, I've even written like a, a guide to like how to write better, uh, reference letters for people of color. And, um, I mean, I think that one thing is, is like, try to expand your network as much as possible if you are in a position where your advisor like people on your committee are maybe not um uh as strong um but then also like in we as the people reviewing recommendation letters um to not necessarily value um the the university just the university or the brand or the the person writing the recommendation letter you know and and see like what what kind of depth and i think that when i get recommendation letters that are like um that are so negative that have said uh things that are pretty inappropriate you know i just i pretend like that letter doesn't exist (laughs) because there it's 
it's not saying something about necessarily the person themselves oftentimes. Um, so I do think that ref recommendation letters are very powerful and are important. And especially I've seen them really help students coming from underrepresented groups. Um, Cause it usually is like a professor that's trying to like lift them up and see them through the pro get through the process. Um, but then I can also see how they're problematic and have seen that um, in the process as well. So I'm going to ask Jane, but I wanted to quickly follow up with you first. Um, given how powerful recommendations letters are, though, do you think that people put up with harassment to get that letter from the, oh, yeah. well, the, from the big name? And is there anything we can do about that, maybe? <laughs> And I mean, I've said this, I've seen this, you know, in students that I've had that they had a letter that was kind of boilerplate from a big name and I was just, and apparently they were not, you know, then these aren't my stories to tell, but they put up with stuff to get those letters. So. Yeah, I think one thing that, um, that a lot of universities are doing now is at least at the grad, I don't know how to deal with it to get into graduate school. That's like a different matter, but um, they have the committee, the graduate committee take a larger role and they detach the funding of the student from a specific person. So they come in guaranteed with five years of support and if someone mistreats them, that means that they go to a different person to work. And so um, you could imagine how that system could involve, like create carrots and sticks for someone to treat their trainee with respect and re treat them well, right? If they have options of who to go to, they're obviously not going to work with a with a person. So I think they're, but not all places have resources like that. That's like a very, I think, outside the norm, um, privileged uh, way to do graduate school. So. But that is one thing that people have been trying so that you have more of like a community of people who and and it takes away a bit this master and apprentice sort of model if you have more of a village that are helping to um, shepherd this new academic into the world. <laughs> so those things can help. Um, it is it is a problematic like, you know, like now, especially now that people are deciding that the GRE and GPA are sort of problematic. Like now, what are we left with? You know, maybe an interview, which can also be problematic. People can just say whatever, right? And then the other thing is, is recommendation letters, and those can be problematic for women and, and people of color too. So it's, um, it is a hard problem. I mean, if it wasn't hard, it would be solved probably already, so. Emissions is, is a terrifying area right now in terms of what do you actually look at? You like said with GREs and GPAs being so arbitrary. Okay, um, well, I want to keep texting about that. Um, there are a lot of questions coming in the Q&A and we don't have a ton of time left. So um, from the Q&A, it seems like the real function of Title IX offices is to protect universities from legal liability in the event of a complaint. For example, the outcome of a lot of Title IX investigations is for faculty with a record of harassment to leave with pay or retirement. Um, so this is to all the panelists. How do you think you can make Title IX offices more effective? Or, I mean, and you kind of touched on this earlier with your Title IX point two, right? Like, are they kind of productive? Can we make them better? And what else can we do? So um, let me, yeah, let me do the same order, Sora. Uh, Jane. I actually haven't had to interact with a Title IX office. I decided not to go that route with my situation because it was it wasn't it would not fall under the the things that the university would ever try to protect me from. So I never like went that course. So I can't really speak about it. Mm. Jane, I know you have thoughts on. Oh, I have a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a total conflict of interest. I mean, there are some like wonderful Title IX offices out there. Um, and like you look at the people and they're like, you know, fresh out of school and want to make a difference. And it's great for them for a few years. And then 
you know, I feel like they get pressured into making various decisions at some point, you know, and uh, yeah, and, and that, that was the kind of, um, you know, from my personal experience, that was the weird thing about the Title IX office is that I thought that they would really want to know about this because, um, you know, here's this person who's been under the radar for so long. Here, here's a person who wants to tell them that that's not been true and they didn't want to hear it. And there was like, it was almost like good cop, bad cop when I was talking to them, except it was bad cop, bad cop in the end. And that was that something that Jennifer Freig, uh, the Stanford affiliate calls um, institutional betrayal. So like, not only are you feeling betrayed by someone who is supposed to be your mentor, but now the very institution that is supposed to be there to help protect you is doing exactly the opposite. And sometimes, you know, can completely twist what you say. And um, it's a terrible feeling to know that you're just like basically alone. And everybody else I... on the other side sometimes. But sometimes it can be okay. I don't want to like say be super afraid of Title IX offices, but um, there there are these like yeah, like kind of in like perverse incentive structures. Let's put it that way. I guess to echo what Jane is saying about this institutional, um, I don't know betrayal aspect like that that. Absolutely. Like in my case, I went and I, you know, told them the things that had happened from this individual um, who was also a, an untenured woman in, in my department. And, um, and they were like, you know, it's really not in our best interest to pursue this. Like I was flat out told that by the college's administration. So um, I think that that is a very real aspect to you know like if you want to be the fighter or like the person that that um that makes a big stink about things like that is a very very true reality of what could happen what does happen yeah. time and time again and i think that circles back to your very first question about what should people do and if you decide to go forward especially going forward to a title nine office uh, you can expect the process to be long, to be non-transparent, and uh, I'm not sure you're going to be satisfied with the outcome. This is not to say you should not pursue that because as, in some cases it does work, but you have to be ready for a fight, a long fight, a tough fight, and you also have to be ready for people to come at you. So um, that's why I think that the real work for changing this is not through legal recourse, uh, legal recourse, certainly for those big, big egregious things like assault and other things. Uh, but I think it's about all of us banding together to, to stand up for what's acceptable in STEM. What, what, what are our norms and what do we tolerate and what are we willing to tolerate and be willing to band together to speak out on these things. And if you, if we can't speak out alone, then, then find some, some allies, some partners, some, some, some colleagues to, to join in and find someone within your professional society to, to stand up with you. Well said and inspiring, I think, note to end with. So uh, we're just about running out of time. Um, so if you're following the chat, there is a Slack channel for debriefing and discussing the film and the panelists will be potentially hanging out there occasionally, and um, so we may be able to listen to discussions. Um, thank you all very, very much for uh, the depth of which you've answered these questions and all the new ideas you've thrown out. I think that we've made some progress. So, and thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank Here's you. Bye.